is Delegate Eric Householder, Majority Leader. Welcome, Eric. You again, thank you for being left out, were you? Eric, Good morning, Eric. Eric, I'm going to leave those two off in their own room someplace else, and they can you know, tell I, they can tell their own truths to each other while you and I discuss well, the issues of the day. I was going to tell you, I enjoy listening to those two banter back and forth just as much as I enjoy listening to Mike Height and his analysis. That was pretty strong. <laughs> he was so. wrong, though, Eric. He was wrong. <laughs> I'll take disgusting and good policies over inept any day. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, no, I'm just a little under the weather. I woke up this morning, a little scratchy, sore throat, 45 degrees down here. I heard Jonathan say he scraped the ice off the window back home in berkeley county but uh yes so i'll suffer through this i'll be okay i just can't wait to get back i've been down here since wednesday of last week so i'm ready to come back home when are you folks uh calling it a day down there this week we're hoping uh to be done today we're going to go in around 11 a.m we'll run at least seven or eight bills take a little break wait for some of the senate messages to come back and then uh, I say sometime, I'm hoping around five or six, if it's not too late, I'll just get on the road and uh, hurry back home. So, Eric, the governor but, has yes. cut his request for an additional 5% income tax cut to an additional 2% income tax cut instead. Does that have a yes. better chance of getting through? Absolutely. And, and that's the thing about what's called this art of compromise. You know, we all want, hey, look, I would have liked to have had 10 percent maybe, but uh, that's not how this whole legislative process works. There's always sometimes a, a need to compromise, and I think the governor was smart in, in uh, reducing it down to 2 percent, also finding those, those uh, fundal, fundamental cuts to pay for that 2 percent. And then House Finance uh, did something yesterday, and I don't know if you were – if you or your listeners were brought up to speed, but it actually does make good common sense uh, for what they did in House Finance yesterday. So every year that we have a trigger, uh, keep in mind whatever whenever that trigger happens in July or August of, of the year that you're in, then the calendar year of January, you know that next that upcoming January is when that tax would take effect. Well, that's in between our budget cycles because our budget runs. Uh, July 1 ends June 30th. So House Finance yesterday decided to not only accept the 2% uh, compromise, but also to delay all tax cuts every time there's a trigger. De delayed at least 18 months to allow, one, the budget cycle to finish, and then it would affect the next budget cycle. And it gives a little bit more stability for the uh, the, the executive branch to do, you know, the budget and to make sure that they account for those loss of revenues. So we have a 4% trigger. We're going to pass a, a, an additional tax cut of 2%. This will go in effect January 1, 2026. The additional, that sense? The additional yes. two or the four? Yes. The, the additional six. The additional six. 4% plus the two. Okay. So we're basically now going to start delaying it for 18 months every time that there's a trigger you know because the, the budget that we just passed is the fiscal year 25 budget that we passed uh, during the regular session and we came back in may to finish it up um so when they come back in february of next year they'll be working on the 2026 budget and then that's when the six percent will take effect is whenever the the 2026 budget starts and uh, that way they can account because keep in mind every time that you have a trigger of whatever that trigger could be you have to have a corresponding cut of expenditures to in order to pay for that loss in revenue so that gives the executive time to uh, find where those cuts are and uh, and to make those necessary changes in the budget and then that that way everything uh, just goes smoothly. Now, so. What made this change apparent this week, Eric, when it might not have been apparent a month ago or a year ago? The uh, Well, I don't know. And, and, and I have to give House Finance and those guys credit because, uh, and I'm sure some of it came from the executive. I listened into the committee meeting yesterday 
sitting down here in my office. And I was like, you know, and I, I didn't even think about it at the time, but no, it's a great idea. You know, just offers a little bit more stability, a little bit more planning, and it is probably the right thing to do. Does let that make a, sense? Eric, let me ask a quick question. Yeah, John. There's an 18 month lag before it actually yes. happens. What yes. happens if something just goes kerplooey economically in the state? Is there a mechanism to have it not happen? If I mean, if things, if the climate completely changes, is there a right. mechanism to to stop it from happening? Well, we have we have two mechanisms. The first mechanism is remember the legislature can change anything, uh, take a, a different course of action at any time. Okay. Um, but also keep in mind, Jonathan, we have $400 million sitting in a personal income tax reserve fund. Okay. This 2% tax cut, that's equal to about $44 million. That's 10 years of reserve sitting there on the sideline if we need to use it. Okay. Okay. So we do have, you know, some safety measures, you know, in place, ready to go in case you see a, a calamity or a catastrophe like you're like you're talking about. I appreciate I appreciate you clarifying yeah, that. That makes yeah. that yeah that really makes a lot more sense. Brings it better into right. light. Eric, another uh, point of clarification, if you will. Uh, you keep using the the tax cut associated with a trigger, uh, with eighteen months uh, uh, delay. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is a tax cut that's not driven by the trigger, would that still be uh, still be obligated to uh, wait eighteen months? Yes. Okay. Yes. So and any two percent is that yeah. prime example, but we we ran the the same exact the personal income tax bill and we changed the language of the bill to always defer it eighteen months. Yeah. So, and that's what's the final product. And uh, and like I said, a lot of times you don't think of some of these unintended consequences, uh, but it's just I think it's better management for the executive. And um, yes, it's a little delay each and every time. But once again, the last thing that you want to do is have tax cuts, put yourself in a situation where you have to come back in and raise taxes or, yeah. or lift that tax cut off. So you don't want to do that. So I just think in the long run, it's, it's best for our citizens and it's best for the state. Eric, yeah. is, is the recent spate of pretty much break even months to start this year influential in this decision as well? Yes. The first three months, you know, we're pretty much. Uh, for instance, at the month ending of uh, September, we had projected our overall revenues to be right around uh, 566 million, and we came in just a little bit north of 567 million. So we were 1.394 million to the positive. But keep in mind, you know, you, you've heard people call in and say, "Hey, I'd like to see these revenue estimates closer to," you know, well, you're seeing that. But I suspect the next nine months. You're going to see, you know, more growth. You're going to see uh, the collections come in stronger. Um, I may want to recant my little estimate of where I thought we were going to be because if I think about this, you know, I, I mentioned, what, uh, two months ago that we should see around a $539 million surplus. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to reach that, you're going to have to see at least now if you see 40 to $50 million, you're going to have to at least see $50 million a month extra, nine months remaining. That's only $450 million surplus. But I think we can still get there. Um, but it, it, it'll be close to what my projections were. But I think you're going to start seeing it coming stronger. That you're going to see stronger collections. Eric, let me shift to another couple of items as sure. well. Uh, the, uh, you took action on supplemental funds to – four or five West Virginia uh, institutions of higher learning, West Virginia University, Marshall, Shepard, Concord. Uh, what was included in the supplemental funding? Well, we're, we're actually going to be running that bill today. So for your listeners, it was the funding formula mechanism. I think this is what you're talking about. We had in the back of the budget uh, $8 million for the funding formula mechanism to uh, – uh, institute funding for these uh, higher ed colleges. The governor vetoed it. So the legislature passed a funding formula mechanism for higher ed and didn't include it in the budget. So the legislature decided this past session to put it in the back of the budget of like $8 million. The governor vetoed it. And now the executive is on board with using this uh, 
one-time surplus money to uh, to backfill and and to uh, get that eight million out to these colleges who have met the metrics of this uh, funding formula. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's another one. Five million dollars for EMS. Uh, is that uh, spread throughout the state? Yeah, well, right now I believe that bill's in committee. We should have that bill today as well. But I believe that there's there's two bills. There's there's five million that's going to HEPC for training of EMS, and we just the governor amended the call yesterday. We're also seeing where the governor added an additional five million dollars for EMS and fire departments. So I'll be listening into finance today to see exactly the particulars of that bill and what's going to happen. So in the Metro News article today on the tax cut. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They quote Kelly Allen, who we've had on the show before, you know, the executive director of the West Virginia Center, Center on Budget and Policy. And she, quote, says, just today they heard from PEIA and the Division of Corrections officials that their flat budget allocations are not enough to fund those agencies' operating costs. And surplus allocations that have been bridging the gap are unlikely to be available even before additional tax cuts. And right. uh, expressing her concern that we can't afford tax cuts right now because of the obligations for at least those two departments. Eric, your comment on that. Okay. And we'll start with PEIA because it's not, the the truth is always somewhere in between, right? When you hear opposing arguments, the truth is always somewhere in between. Uh, From what I gleaned from the PEIA director Cunningham yesterday, uh, there's a, the, the statute requires that PEIA, uh, holds back 10% in a reserve fund to cover expenditures uh, for their for their plan uh, for the participants' plan. Uh, they missed the projections in uh, fiscal year 24 of 42 million dollars, so they were off. Remember, they're they're trying to hold the 10% because it's statutorily and actuarially uh, required to hold back 10% to cover expenditures of the plan. So they missed projections in fiscal year 24 of 24 million. And for fiscal year 25, the budget cycle that we're in, they missed uh, 80 million. So the legislature, PEI, is required to have this money. So we, the legislature, or we, the taxpayers, were the employer. So um, we took corrective action to put 80. We passed a supplemental appropriation to put 87 million dollars, and they assured us yesterday that uh, they think their projections are solid. And they shouldn't have to come back coming moving forward. And um, because if we failed to do this yesterday, you would saw every plan participant, uh, you know, across the whole entire uh, state of West Virginia, you would saw their premiums increase exponentially. So, uh, but no, this is a PEIA reserve fund. It's statutorily required to have 10% held back to pay for all the planned expenditures, and they just missed their pro- projections. So has nothing, nothing to do with the tax cuts. It's a PEIA finance board and the, and the PEIA agency, they missed projections. The 10% reserve fund, uh, yes. how much is left in the reserve fund after paying out for this missed projection? So fiscal year 24, from what I wrote down in my notes, they had $53 million, um, left. So with the supplemental that we passed for $87 million, they should be fine. Are you folks doing anything on uh, vehicular homicide laws? Ever? Not that I'm aware of, no. So a lot of times your special sessions are, are used to, you know, pass a lot of supplemental appropriation spending bills or to give a spending authority to agencies who uh, we had passed a bill or, or created a bill that gave them uh, some type of uh, – um, where they could where they could collect a fee or whatever you could think of, and uh, now they have to ask for spending authority. So a lot of times you'll see some of these supplemental uh, appropriation bills are just spending authorities, uh, but in this case most of them are actual one time spends. A lot of them are deferred maintenance. I know the School of Osteopathic Medicine. We just passed one on the House floor. It's actually going to the governor's desk. Uh, 13.6 million in deferred maintenance at the School of Osteopathic Medicine. I got an email uh, from Delegate Kump, copying yeah. 
you know, Larry copies everybody when he gets an email from oh, somebody. I, yeah, I, I get those. Yeah, so th- this I like one that. Very informative. had to do with vehicular homicide, and then I saw an article on the Metro News website about the same, so it, I didn't know if something was stirring with that. I know Matt Harvey, we've had him on the show as a co-host and as a guest, and he's talked about trying to strengthen those laws over the years, and they don't seem to get anywhere. John, did you have a question? Well, I, I just wanted to follow up on what you were saying about the $8 million for uh, for the higher education, for schools. Mm-hmm. and. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, that's not even a, a Band-Aid for anything. I mean, that's... No, don't forget, Jonathan. Every year we appropriate money in the budget for all four-year institutions and all two-year institutions. Okay? Oh, yeah. Well, no, I... And we just... Sorry, Well, we on. decided, and we, as Republicans, we, we said, hey, look, we should have a funding formula so they can meet certain metrics, and that's how they should be funded. And so this is the first year. This is their base year. We gave them a home a hold harmless clause for three years. But after that, their funding is all determined on them meeting metrics like graduation rates, programs, and so forth. And uh, it's going to reward those colleges that are doing the right things to uh, keep their graduation rates higher, keeping people employed, and so forth. And, um, you know, Shepard has – been on the raw end of the deal for many many years you know uh, it, why is that i don't know it seems like southern west virginia a lot of the institutions down there suck up all the money uh, but um, we've made great strides we, we've helped shepherd out even when i was your finance chair i was able to uh, increase their appropriation in the budget and uh, last session we were able to do 20 million dollars deferred maintenance to a lot of these higher eds and shepherd was on the receiving end of that so we're, we're you know we're trying to be mindful and do everything that we can but i think the funding formula mechanism in the end will benefit shepherd and those institutions that are doing all the right things do you do you think we're going to end up losing more uh colleges here in west virginia i mean i know i mean heck wvu had a 45 million dollar budget deficit last year Shepard, they said that their deficit's about six million over two years. I know Concord, Concord has a big deficit. Yes. Um, I mean, and WVU, I mean, they're huge. It's one point two billion dollar budget. Marshall's three forty five. Right. But is it? I mean, this this trend of online school, the push for all the community colleges and kids go to community college. I mean, mm-hmm. do we need as many colleges as we have in West Virginia? Do we need as many colleges that are funded by the state? And Johnson, would the state be better off funding less yeah. less colleges with more money? I, I think you're going to see it. Eventually, economics is going to force some of these schools to close down. I mean, I even saw a news article where Kanawha County is talking about school massive school consolidations. Well, you know how hard it is to consolidate high schools or schools. Sometimes it's damn near impossible. But economics is going to force some of the these southern counties to, uh, you know, do we need to have Bluefield and Concord, you know, side by side, basically. Um, it's unfortunate, but as the population dwindles in those southern uh, regions, um, economics is going to force decisions to be made by some future legislature or even for for that matter at uh, at the local level some of these county commissions but yeah i i think you're going to see it eventually because i mean look at i mean some schools are just having trouble getting kids i mean somebody i'd read mm-hmm. an article a while back about glenville state that i mean that their their enrollment is so far down compared to what it was 10 years ago that they're they're barely staying afloat and Glenville's trying to do, in fact, the um, gentleman was in the office yesterday because uh, we had given Glenville State, when I say we have given, and the taxpayers gave Glenville State about a million dollars two years ago to help. Uh, they were known to be a, a, a teacher's college you know, to graduate a lot. So they wanted to enhance and, and, and get a nursing program started while still trying to keep uh, – you know, to their graduation rates for, for you know, teachers. And uh, so he stopped in and he said, hey, I, I really thank you guys for doing what you did. It's it's working very well. So I, mean, I think there's hope for Glenville, but uh, some of these southern colleges and community colleges, uh, it might be a lot harder road uh, going forward. 
Well, that's and that's good to hear because I mean Glenville's. It's it's. I've been there. It's a really nice campus. But yeah. In addition to that, we really have a dearth of nurses in West Virginia and all over the country. So any programs, especially in rural areas, that you can get access to nursing education for for kids coming up through high school in rural areas, which are good paying jobs moving forward. That's that's great. Absolutely, and we had a supplemental. It's a three year program to increase recruitment and retention of nurses in the state. And we had a supplemental that's uh, moving through the uh, legislature. We also had a supplemental yesterday to help out rural uh, hospitals to the tune of uh, 40 million to make you know better access to uh, health care throughout, obviously, southern, southern West Virginia and those areas. These rural hospitals in those areas have been suffering for years. Yeah, uh, Eric, uh, uh, last week this subject came up around a roundhouse, a roundtable discussion, and Mike Height was of the opinion that the government should be out of the hospital business. Uh, So how does this uh, uh, coincide with the point that Mike's making? And you have 30 seconds to answer that, by the way. Yeah, well, the problem is, you know, as Republicans for years we've said and said time and time again we need to decentralize. But more and more times, we seem to take on more and more stuff that should be held to county commission's responsibility, like fire and EMS and so forth. But uh, no, it's a balancing act, and we're you know it's just always a fight in the legislature, unfortunately. Eric, thank you very much for your time this morning. Where are you headed next? Yep, uh, I'm supposed to be in a caucus here at eight o'clock, but uh, I'm going to try to get over here and spend the last thirty minutes in caucus. Well, you have a good so, time with that. See you guys. Bye. Take care, Thanks, Eric. Eric.